everyone. Welcome back. I'm Christina, the manager of the Pacific Beach Library. Thank you for joining me for week three, day 11 of our read aloud together of Dracula by Bram Stoker. I'm wondering if I can get a longer R each day. By the end, when we get to chapter 27, it'll be like Dracula. Okay, for today, Dracula. All right. So, <laughs> um, today's tea is the Earl Grey de la Creme, which is getting really close to the end of my little bag. So I'm excited um, to try. Uh, it's always fun to get to finish up a tea that you've enjoyed. And I'm, I have to make the di big decision. Do we get more of the same tea because I really like it? Or do we get a brand new tea to explore? Decisions, decisions, decisions. All right, let's go ahead and pour this one out. I like this one. It's an Earl Grey tea, but it has just that little bit of vanilla to it. And the leaves and the colors in it are just beautiful because it has the petals from cornflower, I believe it is, and calendula. Let's see. Dried sunflower, dried cornflower. My bad, not calendula. Um, cornflower and sunflower petals. It's just beautiful. And then it has that bergamot and the vanilla flavor mixed in with the tradition, you know, with the um with with the Earl Grey tea. Mm, it's really good. Delicious. That's a really nice tea. Um, let's see. So, oh, before we get to talking about yesterday, oh, hello, good to see you, Helen. Um, before we get to talking about what we read on Friday, I want to let you know about a little something that I just posted in the group. Um, so this is one of those good news, maybe not so great news things, but the great news actually is that San Diego Public Library is expanding our services. Um, we are finally at that point where we can, um, we're offering six days of service now. So at my library, well, let's go back. There are 12 libraries offering in-person services, limited in-person services. Um, my, my particular branch, Pacific Beach, is not one of those libraries. But now instead of just Monday through Friday, um, now we're offering Monday through Saturday service where you can call us. Um, we can help you with reference. If there's a book that you want to check out, we can pull that book for you, check it out and bring it out to the table we keep outside of our door. And so we're doing that contactless hold pickup service six days a week now instead of five. That's really good news. Um, the slight little thing that's not so great for our group is that because we are now offering six days of service and the number of staff we have are the same, that means that like for some of our staff, like myself, I'm now working Monday through Thursday and then I'm alternating Fridays and Saturdays. And so for our readings, what that means is that um, I'm not going to be available to do a live reading on Friday anymore. And so I wanted to ask you guys what you would prefer. I'm happy to do either. Um, Hey, I, can, I see Pam there too. Um, let's see, if we are, as we continue, would you like us to only do the live readings, which means we would drop our schedule down to only reading Monday through Thursday, or would you like to do Monday through Thursday where we do this live experience together, um, and then I'll just pre-tape a segment on Friday. Sorry, Pam was asking, I am a payday Saturday, which means I'm off on payday Fridays, which, sorry, that is so library speak. Um, I am... I worked this past Saturday, so that means I'm working this Friday. This is how we have to figure our schedule. And then the other Friday when I'm, so when I, the Fridays that I'm off, well, I think it would just be really confusing to have one week where we do it one way and one week the other. Um, so I'm just thinking I would like us to either go to Monday through Thursday or um, Monday through Thursday plus a tape segment on Fridays. And so I went ahead and created a poll. It's in our Facebook group. So if you could go ahead and vote as to which you'd prefer, I'd really appreciate it. And that way I know how you guys want us to go keep going for the next couple of weeks. And well, we'll see. Actually, Dracula is just a few more weeks and then hopefully we'll read another book after that. So into our next, into our future of how we want to continue our doing our readings. And so, um, yeah. I'll let you guys vote on that. I'll let you know by the end of the week what we decide and we'll proceed from there. So let's talk a little bit about what we read last week. Last week, there was some interesting, interesting things happening in chapter 10. Um, basically, it started out with most of it centered around Lucy Westenra. Lucy's health was fading at the very end of chapter nine. There had been uh, Dr. Seward had been communicating with Dr. Van Helsing and you've been saying, oh, she's doing fine. She's doing fine. And then she's like, oh, my goodness, she is not doing fine. And come over here right away. And that's where chapter 10 began with um, John Seward writing to his good friend, Arthur Holmwood, letting him know, I can't really tell you much, but Dr. Van Helsing is coming out to see Lucy and I'll let you know what we discover afterwards. And then it switches over to an entry from Dr. Seward's diary where he talks about his his discussion with um, Dr. Van Helsing. And Van Helsing basically says, 
Lucy is in grave danger right now. She's very weak. She needs this newfangled thing that science has come up with recently. You may have heard of it. It's called a blood transfusion. Again, keep in mind, this book was published in 1897. Sorry, wrong side. 1897. And a lot of the medical procedures or the, the new innovations that they're talking about this in this book, things like the shorthand alphabet, writing in shorthand, um, also doing a blood transfusion. These things that we think of as basic standard stuff nowadays, or in the case of shorthand, even something really antiquated, were brand new innovations back in 1897. And so Dr. Van Helsing says, you know, we need to give this woman a transfusion of blood if we're going to keep her alive. And he's like, I can't do it. I need you. You're younger. And so he's about to literally hook up Dr. Seward to Lucy Westemra and transfer the blood from one person to another. Oh, my goodness. Um, but just before they can do it, the a knock is heard at the door. And Arthur, um, Arthur, the um, fiancé, comes over and he he says like I got your letter I just wanted I know like maybe you, know, you can't tell me much but I want to know what's going on if I can help in any way and they say yes you can help let's take your blood because you're young you're strong and you're also um you know her fiance you love her and so it's like let's go ahead and get your blood and so they literally they they give um Lucy some medication I think it was morphine I think it was or they give her some sort of opiate to like you know have her pass out and then they hook up Arthur Holmwood to Lucy Westenra and transfer the blood back and forth. Again, with our modern um, knowledge of science, it's just kind of, I don't know. I was talking to a friend who donates blood often and he was saying it was almost, he thought that was like one of the scariest scenes of the book <laughs> just because it was so unsanitary. <laughs> and like, there's not even any tests to make sure are they the right blood types? It's just blood. They're just giving her blood, whatever kind it is. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, they give her the blood and she is doing well. She's doing quite well, actually. It helps her recover. She The color comes back to her cheeks. Arthur is, you know, feeling a bit weak. And so Dr. Van Helsing is like, well, you've earned a kiss. Go ahead and kiss her. She's passed out, but whatever. He kisses her and then he leaves and he goes home. Um, Dr. Van Helsing says, I'm going to go back for now, but I'm going to leave Lucy in your care. What you need to do, and he tells Dr. Seward this very, very particularly, you need to stay awake with her all night while she's sleeping. You need to watch her to make sure that nothing changes for the worse. Again, we know that he's suspicious of there being a vampire in the about, um, but yeah. Um, but Dr. Seward doesn't realize this. And in fact, actually, there was also a scene too in here in this chapter where Dr. Van Helsing advises Dr. Seward, as you're writing your notes, Write anything that seems like it could be possible, even if it's not plausible. I want to get an idea of what you're thinking about this case and the treatment and what, you know, when basically you start to realize that there's a vampire in them. I want to get, try to see what you could be thinking. Um, also in this chapter too, before, right before Arthur leaves, her, um, they talk about how Lucy had a, um, a velvet band that she wears around her throat with jewelry and that it's moved out of the way. And the two doctors see the two little prick marks in her neck. And um, Dr. Van Helsing is rather surprised by it. Um, and Dr. Seward says, I just don't know what to make of it just yet. Um, he later on speculates that it seems like she may have lost blood through that, but how is it possible? There's no blood on the sheets. Where could the blood have gone? Where could the blood have gone? Oh my goodness. Um, so, Dr. Seward is advised that he needs to watch Lucy Westenra. He does indeed stay the night and he, um, he watches over her. She wakes up the next day. She's refreshed. She's healthy. She's doing wonderfully. He goes to work. He comes the next evening to her house and he is going to stay again. By now he's had, you know, sleepless night, two, two days of work. He's rather exhausted. And she says, I'm doing so well. You don't need to stay up with me. You're welcome to stay in the room next door to mine. Why don't you leave your door open? I'll leave my door open. And then if I need anything, I'll call out to you. He says, that's a great idea. And then he's even drinking at dinner. So you know, he's not going to hear anything. Oh, it's like a recipe for disaster. The next morning they wake up. Oh, and by the way, oh, it's just terrible. Like Lucy has a diary entry where she's saying, I feel so healthy. I feel so blessed. I have such good friends, people looking after me. It's going to be wonderful. The next day when he wakes up, She's doing horribly. And of course, Dr. Van Helsing is coming to town and he shows him and he's like, oh, because like how terribly she's doing. It's like um, all the progress that has been made has been lost. It's like she needs more blood. 
this time it's got to be you. We can't call her fiance back again. And so they do another transfusion. This time it's Dr. Seward's blood that is given to restore Lucy with Stenra. And um, Van Helsing says, I will stay tonight. You go home, <laughs> eat, drink, and rest. Make yourself strong. I will stay with her and watch over. And then I have some ideas about things we can do. And so basically... What Van Helsing ends up doing is that he calls to a friend of his over um, in Harlem. And again, that's Harlem, H-A-A-R-E-L-M, H-A-A-R-L-E-M. So the Harlem that the New York Harlem was named after from um, over in the Netherlands. And so he gets his friend who has glass houses and raised plants to send him a bunch of garlic flowers and blossoms. And so Van Helsing decorates Lucy's room basically with all these garlic blossoms. He rubs it along the curtains, along the edges of her windows. And he even makes a wreath for her, which I'm guessing is sort of like a lei or a necklace. And he puts that around her and says, you must keep it on. You must have it. And, and you know, I need you to sleep in peace. And, you know, keep these things. And, you know, it's not a joke because she's like, why are you giving me dirty garlic? And he's like, no, no, you must have it. It's very important. The smell will help. And um, he says, do not disturb it. Even if the room feels closed, do not tonight open the window or the door. And so Van Helsing, again, we know that he strongly suspects what is causing Lucy's blood loss and her weakness. But he's not saying it yet. And then he tells Van Helsing that to watch a little bit longer, that he has things he needs to check on and that he's going to go. And so Van Helsing is quite confident at this point that Lucy is going to be protected because of the garlic he's left in the room. But the chapter ended with Seward feeling less sure of that because he had been so certain that Lucy would, you know, recover before that night when, you know, he drank and he passed out in the room next to her and, she, you know, did not watch her like he was supposed to. And then she woke up feeling rather weak. So that's where we left off. Today's a shorter chapter. Um, let's see. Hmm. That is such a good tea. All right. Chapter 11. It starts out again with Lucy with Stenra's diary. 12 September. How good they all are to me. I quite love that dear Dr. Van Helsing. I wonder why he was so anxious about these flowers. He positively frightened me. He was so fierce. And yet he must have been right, for I feel comfort from them already. Somehow I do not dread being alone tonight, and I can go to sleep without fear. I shall not mind any flapping outside the window. Oh, the terrible struggle that I have had against sleep so, so often of late the pain of the sleeplessness or the pain of the fear of sleep and with such unknown horrors as it has for me. How blessed are some people whose lives have no fears, no dreads, to whom sleep is a blessing that comes nightly and brings nothing but sweet dreams. Well, here I am tonight hoping for sleep and lying like Ophelia in the play with virgin crants and maiden struments. I never liked garlic before, but tonight it is delightful. There is peace in its smell. I feel sleep coming already. Good night, everybody. Dr. Seward's Diary. 13 September. Called at the Berkeley and found Van Helsing, as usual, up to time. The carriage ordered from the hotel was waiting. The professor took his bag, which he always brings with him now. Let all be put down exactly. Van Helsing and I arrived at Hillingham at 8 o'clock. It was a lovely morning. The bright sunshine and all the fresh feeling of early autumn seemed like the completion of nature's annual work. The leaves were turning to all kinds of beautiful colors, but had not yet begun to drop from the trees. When we entered, we met Mrs. Westenra coming out of the morning room. She was always an early riser. She greeted us warmly and said, You will be glad to know that Lucy is better. The dear child is still asleep. I looked into her room and saw her, but did not go in, lest I should disturb her. The professor smiled and looked quite jubilant. He rubbed his hands together and said, Aha! I thought I had diagnosed the case. My treatment is working. To which she answered, You must not take all the credit to yourself, doctor. Lucy's state this morning is due in part to me. Well, how do you mean, ma'am? asked the professor. Well, I was anxious about the dear child in the night and went into her room. She was sleeping soundly, so soundly that even my coming did not wake her. But the room was awfully stuffy. There were a lot of those horrible, strong-smelling flowers about everywhere, and she had actually a bunch of them round her neck. 
I feared that the heavy odor would be too much for the dear child in her weak state, so I took them all away and opened a bit of the window to let in a little fresh air. You will be pleased with her, I am sure. She moved off into her boudoir, where she usually breakfasted early. As she had spoken, I watched the professor's face and saw it turn ashen gray. He had been able to retain his self-command whilst the poor lady was present, for he knew her state and how mischievous a shock would be. He actually smiled on her as he held open the door for her to pass into her room. But the instant she had disappeared, he pulled me suddenly and forcibly into the dining room and closed the door. Then, for the first time in my life, I saw Van Helsing break down. He raised his hands over his head in a sort of mute despair and then beat his palms together in a helpless way. Finally, he sat down on a chair and putting his hands before his face began to sob with loud, dry sobs that seemed to come from the very racking of his heart. Then he raised his arms again as though appealing to the whole universe. God, 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 he said. What have we done? What has this poor thing done that we are so sore beset? Is there fate amongst us still, sent down from the pagan world of old, that such things must be and in this way? This poor mother, all unknowing, and all for the best as she think, does such thing as lose her daughter, body and soul. And we must not tell her, we must not even warn her, or she die, and then both die. Oh, how we are beset. How are all the powers of the devils against us? Suddenly, he jumped to his feet. Come, he said, come, we must see and act. Devils or no devils, or all the devils at once, it matters not. We fight him all the same. He went to the hall door for his bag, and together we went up to Lucy's room. Once again, I drew up the blind whilst Van Helsing went towards the bed. This time, he did not start as he looked on the poor face with the same awful waxen pallor as before. He wore a look of stern sadness and infinite pity. As I expected, he murmured with that hissing inspiration of his which meant so much. Without a word, he went and locked the door and then began to set out on the little table the instruments for yet another operation of transfusion of blood. I had long ago recognized the necessity and begun to take off my coat, but he stopped me with a warning hand. No, he said, today you must operate. I shall provide. You are weakened already. As he spoke, he took off his coat and rolled up his shirt sleeve. Again, the operation. Again, the narcotic. Again, some return of color to the ashy cheeks and the regular breathing of healthy sleep. This time I watched whilst Van Helsing recruited himself and rested. Presently he took an opportunity of telling Mrs. Westenra that she must not remove anything from Lucy's room without consulting him, that the flowers were of medicinal value and that the breathing of their odor was a part of the system of cure. Then he took over the care of the case himself, saying that he would watch this night and the next and would send me word when to come. After another hour, Lucy waked from her sleep, fresh and bright and seemingly not much the worse for her terrible ordeal. What does it all mean? I am beginning to wonder if my long habit of life among the insane is beginning to tell upon my own brain. Lucy Westenra's Diary, 17 September. Four days and nights of peace. I am getting so strong again that I hardly know myself. It is as if I had passed through some long nightmare and had just awakened to see the beautiful sunshine and feel the fresh air of the morning around me. I have a dim remembrance of long, anxious times of waiting and fearing, darkness in which there was not even the pain of hope to make present distress more poignant, and then long spells of oblivion and the rising back to life as a diver coming up through a great press of water. Since, however, Dr. Van Helsing has been with me, all this bad dreaming seems to have passed away. The noises that used to frighten me out of my wits, the flapping against the windows, the distant voices which seemed so close to me, the harsh sounds that came from I know not where and commanded me to do I know not what, have all ceased. I go to bed now without any fear of sleep. 
I do not even try to stay awake. I have grown quite fond of the garlic, and a box full arrives for me every day from Harlem. Tonight, Dr. Van Helsing is going away, as he has to be for a day in Amsterdam, but I need not be watched. I am well enough to be left alone. Thank God for Mother's sake and dear Arthur's, and for all our friends who have been so kind. I shall not even feel the change, for last night Dr. Van Helsing slept in his chair a lot of the time. I found him asleep twice when I awoke, but I did not fear to go to sleep again, although the boughs or bats or something flapped almost angrily against the window panes. The Pall Mall Gazette, 18 September. The Escaped Wolf. Perilous adventure of our interviewer. Interview with the keeper in the zoological gardens. After many inquiries and almost as many refusals, and perpetually using the words, Paul Mall Gazette is a sort of talisman, I managed to find the keeper of the section of the zoological gardens in which the wolf department is included. Thomas Builder lives in one of the cottages in the enclosure behind the elephant house and was just sitting down to his tea when I found him. Thomas and his wife are hospitable folk, elderly and without children, and if the specimen I enjoyed of their hospitality be of the average kind, their lives must be pretty comfortable. The keeper would not enter on what he called business until the supper was over and we were all satisfied. Then when the table was cleared and he had lit his pipe, he said, now, sir, you can go on and ask me what you want. You'll excuse me refusing to talk of prefer professional subjects of four meals. I gives the wolves and the jackals and the hyenas and all our section their tea before I begins to ask them questions. How do you mean, ask them questions, I queried wishful to get him into a talkative humor. Itting of them over the head with a pole is one way, scratching of their ears is another. When gents as is flush wants a bit of a shorf to their gals, I don't so much mind the fust, the itting with a pole afore as I chucks in their dinner, but I waits till they've had their sherry and coffee, so to speak, afore I tries on with the ear scratching. Mind you, he added philosophically, there is a deal of the same nature in us as in them, their animales. Anim Here's you a coming and arskin of me questions about me business, and I that grump like that only for your bloomin' arf quid, it is seen you blowed fust for I'd answer. <laughs> Not even you when you arsed me sarcastic like if I'd like you to arsk the superintendent if I might arsk, you quest arsk me questions. Without offense, did I tell you to go to L? You did. <laughs> and when you said you'd report me for using obscene language, that was it in you over the head. But the arf quid made that all right. I weren't a going to fight, so I waited for the food and did with my owl as the wolves and lions and tigers does. But Lord love your art. Now that the old woman has stuck a chunk of her tea cake in me and rinsed me out with her bloomin' old teapot and I've lit up, you may scratch my ears for all you're worth, and I won't get even a growl out of me. Drive along with your questions. I know what you're a-coming at, and that dear escaped wolf. Exactly. I want you to give me your view of it. Just tell me how it happened, and when I know the facts, I'll get you to say what you consider was the cause of it, and how you think the whole affair will end. All right, Governor. This year is about the old story. That air wolf, what we call Bersicker, was one of three gray ones that come from Norway to Jam Rocks, which we, brought, which we bought off him four years ago. He was a nice, well-behaved wolf that never, gave him, that never gave no trouble to talk of. I am more surprised at him for wanting to get out, nor any other animal in this place. But there, you can't trust wolves no more, nor women. <laughs> Don't you mind him, sir, broke in Mrs. Tom with a cheery laugh. He's got minding the animals so long, the blessed if he ain't like an old wolf himself. But there ain't no arm in him. <laughs> well, sir, it was about two hours after feeding yesterday when I first heard my disturbance. I was making up a litter in the monkey house for a young puma which is ill. But when I heard the yelping and owling, I came straight away. There was Bersicker, a terran like a mad thing at the bars as if he wanted to get out. There wasn't much people about that day, and close at hand was only one man, a tall, thin chap, with a hook nose and a pointed beard, with a few white hairs running through it. 
He had a hard, cold look and red eyes, and I took a sort of mislike to him, for it seemed as if it was him as they was irritated at. He had white kid gloves on his hands, and he pointed out the animals to me and said, Keeper, these wolves seem upset at something. Maybe it's you, says I, for I did not like the airs as he give himself. He didn't get angry as I hoped he would, but he smiled a kind of insolent smile with a mouth full of white sharp teeth. Oh no, they wouldn't like me, he says. Oh yes they would, says I, imitating of him. They always like a bone or two to clean their teeth on about tea time, which you as a bag full. Well, it was a odd thing, but when the animals see us a talkin', they lay down, and when I went over to Persicker, he let me stroke his ears, same as ever. That there man came over, and blessed but if he didn't put in his hand and stroke the old wolf's ears too. Tight care, says I. Persicker is quick. Never mind, he says. I'm used to him. Are you in the business yourself, I says, tight in my at. Taken off my at, for a man what trades in wolves... And Setterer is a good friend to keepers. No, says he, not exactly in the business, but I have made pets of several. And with that, he lifts his at as polite as a lord and walks away. Old Bersicker kept a look in arter him, arter him till he was out of sight, and then went and lay down in a corner and wouldn't come out the whole evening. Well, last night, so soon as the moon was up, the wolves here all began a owlin'. There wasn't nothing for him to owl at. There weren't no one near, except someone that was evidently a calling a dog somewheres out back of the gardens in the park road. Once or twice I went out to see that all was right, and it was, and then the owling stopped, just before twelve o'clock. I just took a look round before turning in and bust me, but when I came opposite to old Bersicker's cage, I see the rails broken and twisted about, and the cage empty. And that's all I know for certain. Did anyone else see anything? One of our gardeners was a coming home about that time from a harmony when he sees a big gray dog coming out through the gardening edges. At least so he says, but I don't give much for it myself. For if he did, he never said a word about it to his missus when he got home, and it was only after the escape of the wolf was made known and we had been up all night a hunting of the park for Berserker, Berserker that he remembered seeing anything. My own belief was that the harmony had got into his head. Now, Mr. Builder, can you account in any way for the escape of the wolf? Well, sir, he said with a suspicious sort of modesty, I think I can, but I don't know as how you'd be satisfied with the theory. Certainly I shall. If a man like you, who knows the animals from experience, can't hazard a good guess at any rate, who is even to try? Well then, sir, I accounts for it this way. It seems to me that air wolf escaped simply because he wanted to get out. From the hearty way that both Thomas and his wife laughed at the joke, I could see that it had done service before, and that the whole explanation was simply an elaborate sell. I couldn't cope in badinage with the worthy Thomas, but I thought I knew a surer way to his heart, so I said, Now, Mr. Builder, we'll consider that first half-sovereign worked off, and this brother of his is waiting to be claimed when you've told me what you think will happen. Right you are, sir, he said briskly. You'll excuse me, I know, for a chaffin' of you, but the old woman here winked at me, which is as much as telling me to go on. Well, I never, said the old lady. My opinion is this, that air wolf is a hidin' of somewheres. The gardener what didn't remember said he was a gallopin' northward faster than a horse could go. But I don't believe him, for you see, sir, wolves don't gallop no more, nor dogs does. They not being built that way. Wolves is fine things in a storybook, and I dare say when they get some packs and doves be chivying something that's m that's more feared than they is, they can make a devil of a noise and chop it up, whatever it is. But Lord bless you, in real life, a wolf is only a low creature, not half so clever or bold as a good dog, and not half a quarter so much fight in him. This one ain't been used to fightin' or even to providin' for hisself, and more like he's somewhere round the park a idin' and a shiverin' of, and if he thinks at all, wonderin' where he is to get his breakfast from, or maybe he's got down some area and is in a coal cellar. My eye, won't some cook get a rum start when she sees his green eyes a-shinin' on her out of the dark? 
If he can't get food, he's bound to look for it, and mayhap he may chance to light on a butcher's shop in time. If he doesn't, and some nursemaid goes a walkin' of orf with the soldier, leaving of the infant in the perambulator, well, then I shouldn't be surprised if the census is one babby the less. That's all. I was handing him the half-sovereign when something came bobbing up against the window, and Mr. Builder's face doubled its natural length with, with a surprise. "'God bless me,' he said. "'If that ain't old berserker, come back by yourself.' He went to the door and opened it. A most unnecessary proceeding, it seemed to me. I have always thought that a wild animal never looks so well as when some obstacle of pronounced durability is between us. A personal experience has intensified rather than diminished that idea. After all, however, there was nothing like custom, for neither Builder nor his wife thought any more of the wolf than I should of a dog. The animal itself was as peaceful and well-behaved as that father of all picture wolves, Red Riding Hood's quan quondam friend, whilst moving her confidence in masquerade. The whole scene was an inutterable mix of, mixture of comedy and pathos, the wicked wolf that for half a day had paralyzed London and set all the children in the town shivering in their shoes was there in a sort of penitent mood and was received and petted like a sort of vulpine prodigal son. Old Builder examined him all over with most tender solicitude, and when he had finished with his penitent said, There, I knew the poor old chap would get into some kind of trouble. Didn't I say it all along? Here's his head all cut and full of broken glass. He's been a-getting over some bloomin' wall or other. It's a shame that people are allowed to top their walls with broken bottles. This year's what comes of it. Come along, Bersicker. He took the wolf and locked him up in a cage with a piece of meat that satisfied, in quantity at any rate, the elementary conditions of the fatted calf and went off to report. I came off too, to report the only exclusive information that is given today regarding the strange escapade at the zoo. Dr. Seward's Diary, 17 September. I was engaged after dinner in my study posting up my books, which, through press of other work and the many visits to Lucy, had fallen sadly into her rear. Suddenly, the door was burst open, and in rushed my patient with his face distorted with passion. I was thunderstruck, for such a thing as a patient getting of his own accord into, this, into the superintendent's study is almost unknown. Without an instant's pause, he made straight at me. He had a dinner knife in his hand, and as I saw he was dangerous, I tried to keep the table between us. He was too quick and too strong for me, however, for before I could get my balance, he had struck at me and cut my left wrist rather severely. Before he could strike again, however, I got in my right, and he was sprawling on his back on the floor. My wrist bled freely, and quite a little pool trickled onto the carpet. I saw that my friend was not intent on further effort and occupied myself binding up my wrist, keeping a wary eye on the prostrate figure all the time. When the attendants rushed in and we turned our attention to him, his employment positively sickened me. He was lying on his belly on the floor, licking up, like a dog, the blood which had fallen from my wounded wrist. He was easily secured and to my surprise went with the attendants quite placidly, simply repeating over and over again, the blood is the life. The blood is the life. I cannot afford to lose blood just at present. I have lost too much of late for my physical good. And then the prolonged strain of Lucy's illness and its horrible phases is telling on me. I am overexcited and weary, and I need rest, rest, rest. Happily, Van Helsing has not summoned me, so I need not forego my sleep. Tonight, I could not well do without it. Telegram, Van Helsing, Antwerp, to Seward, Carfax. Sent to Carfax, Sussex, as no county given. Delivered late by 22 hours. 17 September. Do not fail to be at Hillingham tonight. If not watching all the time, frequently visit and see that flowers are as placed. Very important. Do not fail. Shall be with you as soon as possible after arrival. Dr. Seward's Diary. 18 September. Just off train to London. The arrival of Van Helsing's telegram filled me with dismay. A whole night lost, and I know by bitter experience what may happen in a night. Of course, it is possible that all may be well, but what may have happened... 
Surely there is some horrible doom hanging over us that every possible accident should thwart us in all we try to do. I shall take this cylinder with me, and then I can complete my entry on Lucy's phonograph. Memorandum left by Lucy Westenra, 17 September, night. I write this and leave it to be seen, so that no one may by any chance get into trouble through me. This is an exact record of what took place tonight. I feel I am dying of weakness and have barely strength to write, but it must be done if I die in the doing. I went to bed as usual, taking care that the flowers were placed as Dr. Van Helsing directed, and soon fell asleep. I was waked by the flapping at the window, which had begun after that sleepwalking on the cliff at Whitby, when Mina saved me, but which now I know so well. I was not afraid, but I did wish that Dr. Seward was in the next room, as Dr. Van Helsing said he would be, so that I might have called him. I tried to go to sleep, but I could not. Then there came to me the old fear of sleep, and I determined to keep awake. Perversely, sleep would try to come then when I did not want it. So, as I feared to be alone, I opened my door and called out, Is there anybody there? There was no answer. I was afraid to wake mother, and so closed my door again. Then outside in the shrubbery, I heard a sort of howl like a dog's, but more fierce and deeper. I went to the window and looked out, but could see nothing except a big bat which had evidently been buffeting its wings against the window. So I went back to bed again, but determined not to go to sleep. Presently the door opened and mother looked in. Seeing by my moving that I was not asleep, came in and sat by me. She said to me even more sweetly and softly than her wont, I was uneasy about you, darling, and came in to see that you were all right. I feared she might catch cold sitting there and asked her to come in and sleep with me. So she came into bed and lay down beside me. She did not take off her dressing gown, for she said she would only stay a while and then go back to her own bed. As she lay there in my arms and I in hers, the flapping and buffeting came to the window again. She was startled and a little frightened and cried out, What is that? I tried to pacify her and at last succeeded and she lay quiet but I could hear her poor dear heart still beating terribly. After a while, there was the howl again out in the shrubbery, and shortly after that was a crash at the window, and a lot of broken glass was hurled on the floor. The window blind blew back with the wind that rushed in, and in the aperture of the broken panes, there was the head of a great gaunt gray wolf. Mother cried out in a fright and struggled up into a seating posture and clutched wildly at anything that would help her. Amongst other things, she clutched the wreath of flowers that Dr. Van Helsing insisted on my wearing round my neck and tore it away from me. For a second or two, she sat up, pointing at the wolf, and there was a strange and horrible gurgling in her throat. Then she fell over, as if struck with lightning, and her head hit my forehead and made me dizzy for a moment or two. The room and all round, and all round seemed to spin round. I kept my eyes fixed on the window, but the, but the wolf drew his head back, and a whole myriad of little specks seems to come blowing in through the broken window and wheeling and circling round like the pillar of dust that travelers describe when there is a simoon in the desert. I tried to stir, but there was some spell upon me and dear mother's poor body, which seemed to grow cold already, for her dear heart had ceased to beat, weighed me down and I remembered no more for a while. The time did not seem long, but very, very awful, till I recovered consciousness again. Somewhere near, a passing bell was tolling. The dogs all around the neighborhood were howling, and in our shrubbery, seemingly just outside, a nightingale was singing. I was dazed and stupid with pain and terror and weakness, but the sound of the nightingale seemed like the voice of my dead mother come back to comfort me. The sounds seemed to have awakened the maids too, for I could hear their bare feet pattering outside my door. I called to them, and they came in, and when they saw what had happened and what it was that lay over me on the bed, they screamed out. The wind rushed in through the broken window, and the door slammed too. They lifted off the body of my dear mother and laid her, covered up with a sheet, on the bed after I had got up. 
They were all so frightened and nervous that I directed them to go to the dining room and have each a glass of wine. The door flew open for an instant and closed again. The maid shrieked and then went in a body to the dining room, and I laid what flowers I had on my dear mother's breast. When they were there, I remembered what Dr. Van Helsing had told me, but I didn't like to remove them, and besides, I would have some of the servants to sit up with me now. I was surprised that the maids did not come back. I called them, but got no answer, so I went to the dining room to look for them. My heart sank when I saw what had happened. They all four lay helpless on the, on the floor, breathing heavily. The decanter of sherry was on the table half full, but there was a queer, acrid smell about it. I was suspicious and examined the decanter. It smelled of laudanum, and looking on the sideboard, I found that the bottle which Mother's doctor uses for her, oh, did use, was empty. What am I to do? What am I to do? I am back in the room with Mother. I cannot leave her, and I am alone, save for the sleeping servants whom someone has drugged. Alone with the dead. I dare not go out, for I can hear the low howl of the wolf through the broken window. The air seems full of specks, floating and circling in the drought from the window, and from the light, and the lights burn blue and dim. What am I to do? God shield me from harm this night. I shall hide this paper in my breast, where they shall find it when they come to lay me out. My dear mother gone, it is time that I go too. Goodbye, dear Arthur, if I should not survive this night. God keep you, dear, and God help me. Wow! That was very dramatic. I'm not reading ahead, as you guys may have figured out. That went from the comedic bit of the, of the zookeeper... Um, talking about the wolf that had disappeared to finding out what that wolf had done on behest of Dracula. Oh my goodness. All right, we'll have to continue tomorrow to see if Lucy Westenra survives the night. Um, we know Dr. Seward is a terrible, terrible babysitter. Um, but yeah, let's, let, we'll see what happens tomorrow in chapter 12. Oh, I'm really, really going to have to fight the temptation to read ahead. All right, I'm going to not do it so we can discover this together tomorrow. But this is that was a lovely cliffhanger. Oh, oh my goodness. Okay, so we're going to end with today end today's reading. Um, as I did mention at the beginning, if you do have a chance to go ahead and vote in the poll as to how you would like us to continue, if we should drop down to just Monday through Thursday for the live streams, or if we should do the thir Monday through Thursday live stream supplemented by a recording on Fridays, um, just let me know what your preference is, and we'll go from there. All right, so thank you very much. I hope you've enjoyed today's reading. I certainly did. i I feel a lot of suspense about what's going to happen tomorrow. Okay, so let's, I'll see you then. Um, I'll see you tomorrow for more reading of Dracula by Bram Stoker. And until then, I hope you have a great rest of your day. Take care. Bye.